Good evening, everyone. We'll get started here in just a minute. It is 6.59, and we'll begin with our midweek Bible study. Good evening and welcome. It's now seven o'clock. We'll get started here in just a few minutes. I'm getting everything set up on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, broadcast live. Gary doesn't lie. Gary. And boss, not for three months, suddenly cold and blue. What's with the hot tea? Is it the buyer again? Brenda, if you don't want to show the house, Okay, still waiting for everything to pop up on my end so I can share it, and then we'll get started. Okay. All right. Well, good evening, everyone who is on Zoom. Everyone who is joining on Facebook. I see a couple people chiming in. Sister Jensi, good evening. God bless you. Welcome. Sister Janaki is on, uh, the Campbells, Deacon and Margaret, and Deaconess Margaret. Good evening. God bless you. Welcome. Good evening. Oh, good evening. How are you? Oh, just fine. Are you all? Great. Good to hear your voice, Sister Gail. Mm -hmm. I see uh, Sister Singleton is on. Good evening. God bless you. Mm -hmm. Someone is on by iPhone. It doesn't have a name. It just says iPhone. <laughs> but we're glad you joined. iPhone, we're glad you're here. <laughs> God knows who you are. <laughs> well, I had a good trip back home to Cleveland last weekend. Um, got to spend a lot of good time with my brothers and sisters. They really rolled out the red carpet for me. They drove me all over town, wherever I wanted to go. They got me all the food that I like to eat from the different places and uh, seeing my mom and dad has been a long time. So that was really nice. Oh, that's wonderful. So, so thank you. You had an awesome trip. <laughs> yeah. I tell you, there's nothing like family, I tell you. Mm -hmm. But you know what? There's nothing, I also say there's nothing like friends who are like family you know god gives you surrogates yeah. sure I do. I good evening I family good evening welcome god bless you. yeah i believe Try god to hear you yes it is it's good to be heard <laughs> yeah and it's good to, that you back home safely we yeah. miss you yeah Thank yeah you. well my pastor in cleveland um his, uh, he had his retirement uh, sermon while he was there. He preached his last sermon as pastor of New Sardis Primitive Baptist Church. That's where that was my home church. So I actually got to be there for his final sermon. That was actually uh, a very special as well. Wonderful. Yeah, he was pastor there 35 years. Oh, yeah. Wow. And then Sunday, our pastor, Pastor Ivan Cowan, will have his pastoral anniversary so they're they're lined up with one another how about that <laughs> how about that <laughs> right thank god <laughs> oh yes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all right well let's go ahead and get started with tonight's lesson i know others will be joining and clicking and let's open up in prayer lord we just thank you you are the god of mercy you're the god of love we just thank you for your grace that you shine down upon us. Undeserved merit is what grace is. 
you look at us and you see our mess, but you clean us up and you say we are righteous, not because of our own doing, but because of Jesus Christ. We are made righteous. We are justified by the cross. Lord, we thank you for watching over us, our days and our nights, even when we're sleeping and are unconscious to the world, you're watching over us with your hand of protection. You set your angels around us, and Lord, you allow us to see another day. We just thank you. We give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. Lord, we ask you to help us to come and just open ourselves up to you, open ourselves up to your word, show us those things inside of us that are not like you, and remove them. Father, we pray for Pastor Cowan and First Lady Darlene. Bless them, protect them, watch over them. As we look forward to celebrating this Sunday, uh, a pastor's anniversary, we give you all the glory. We thank you, Lord, for placing him and keeping him, raising him up and sustaining him all these years. Lord, we pray for all the heads of ministries. We pray for everyone who is on this call tonight, those, Father, who love your word and want to study it and learn more about you. Father, you're, you, you are unsearchable in many ways. We can never understand you completely. But Lord, you've given us your word. You've given us a glimpse of who you are. You've placed your Holy Spirit in our hearts so we can connect to you. And so, Lord, I'm just thankful for my relationship with you. I know each one on this call is thankful for their relationship with you. It's the number one relationship every person ought to have. Father, we pray for our children, grandchildren, great-grands. We pray for uh, a ch church family. Uh, we pray, Lord, for family members abroad and who are no longer near us, but we miss them and love them. Father, just watch over us and keep us. Bless us. Uh, bless us beyond what we deserve. Lord, we love you because you loved us first. Now, help us to read your word, to understand it better, and know how much you love us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Getting some feedback there. All right, let's get into our lesson for tonight. We're starting chapter two. We're still in part one, but chapter two. Um, Chapter two is entitled, An Inside Look Can Be Frustrating. And uh, I, I think most of us would agree that sometimes being a Christian can be frustrating, right? Right. Frustrating because maybe you can't do the things that you know you ought to do. Frustrating because you see others that you've poured into, that you've told the truth and taught the truth, and they're not walking the way you know that they're capable of walking in Christ. Frustrating in that, you know, you know, think about even some of the, the Bible heroes, the, the people in the Bible, they were frustrated many times with what God had called them to do, but what man would not allow them to do. There's frustration in the Christian life, first of all, because our agenda is not the world's agenda. We're here on mission for God, representing the kingdom, and this earth is everything but kingdom-like in many ways. So there's always going to be a frustration. I think there's always going to be a, a tension. There's always going to be this strain on our Christian life and our Christian walk because this world is full of sin. This world is full of rebellion. This world is uh, ruled by the spirit of Antichrist. Um, the God of darkness, uh, Satan, very much has a stronghold on people in their hearts. And so, yeah, there's going to be frustration. And here's the thing, the frustration isn't always from the outside. Our frustration many times comes from what's with what's within us. Amen. Okay. Yeah. So let's get into our study. We're on page 43. If you have the the book with the uh, white and blue cover. But if you have a different book, I, I believe you can keep up as well. We're an inside look can be frustrating. Page 39. Page 39 in the other book. Great. Thank you, Sister East. Now, before I get started, though, I want to praise God for victories. Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise for victories in our lives? <laughs> yeah. You know, I don't want to paint this picture. I know the author kind of comes from a gloom and doom perspective, 
But man, I was at Food Line picking up dinner and I was on my way back home and I and I was like, you know, God is good. <laughs> All the time. God is good. If you've had some small mm. victories and you know how to praise God, you know, it don't have to be anything big. It can be just a small thing, um, something mm. that you prayed for and God gave it to you. Um, something you've been believing in another believer's life and they got it, whatever it is that they were praying for. Um, somebody may have gotten saved or somebody, you know, got baptized. So there are plenty of reasons for us to praise and uh, shout victory in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Uh, I, I didn't, I didn't want to pe- let that moment pass without a little praise break. All right. Amen. <laughs> Uh, The author starts out, he talks about a struggle that goes back to his childhood. He said, I remember sitting in Sunday school as a small boy, listening attentively to my teacher describing the Christian struggle, the struggle to be good. He said that within each of us, there is a bad dog and a good dog. (laughs) And I've heard that (laughs) illustration before. Uh, I've heard it been told that it's an ancient uh, Native American proverb that within each person, there's a good dog and a bad dog. And the one that you feed the most is the one who will win. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, in a, in a carnal sense, that makes a lot of sense. You know, one gets weaker, the other one gets stronger, right? If you feed them both, then you're going to be in a battle. But if you allow one to starve, then the fight's a little easier for the other one. Well, I think our goal should be to starve the bad dog, starve our flesh, starve our, uh, uh, you know, the sinful man, the natural man, but feed the spiritual man. I believe if we do more to feed the spiritual man, then certainly we will have more vic- more victories. Because it's uh, it's hard for a foe when they don't have any strength or might. So um, the author went on, he said that the bad dog can never be tamed into a lovable pet. And no, that's never going to happen. You know, the the natural man is just that. The natural woman is just that natural. We do the things of our human nature. And we know that we are of Adam's nature. We have a fallen nature. There are those who believe that humans are inherently good, but that's not what the Bible says. And so the bad dog is always present, always growling, always barking, always trying to get off the leash to wreak havoc in your life. The author then, yes, the author then says the good dog, however, was placed in our heart by God. This is what his Sunday school teacher used to tell him. And when we became a Christian and and, and it was already tame. The good dog always wants to do the right thing. The bad dog equals our old nature, that part of us that wants to do bad or wants to do wrong. The good dog represents our new nature in Christ and helps us defeat the old and bad nature. The author said, when we feel tempted, all we have to do is call on the good dog to whip the bad dog into submission. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's how his teacher explained the battle that we as believers go through a good dog, a bad dog, the good dog. When all we got to do is call him and he'll come in and save the day. Well, that's a pretty simplistic look at it, but it does kind of mirror what the scripture says. Let's look at Galatians chapter five, verses 16 and 17. This I say, then walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that you would. So let let me move something over here. I'm sorry, I'm still a share. I forgot to share it to my page. Okay, now, yeah, so this scripture in Galatians 5, 16 through 17 really capsitalizes what this the, the author Sunday school teacher was trying to teach him about the good dog and the bad dog. 
Paul writes to the Galatians, this I say then, walk in the spirit. And what does it mean to walk? Is there a certain way you walk? Certain shoes you're supposed to wear? Well, it's not, it's using walk as a metaphor. It's just really, it's how you live. How you govern yourselves, how how you think about things, uh, the things you say, the places you go, how you, the activities you involve yourself in. That's what it's talking about here. Walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And isn't that what we all want? We don't want to fulfill the desires of the natural man. We want to fulfill the desires of God. Jesus said, I've come to do my father's business. So he had to walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Let me go ahead and close that up. I keep ring-a-dinging. Verse 17, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. See, there's the two dogs fighting against one another. They're at war. They're at odds against each other. And so let me just pause right here. If you're on this call tonight and you, let's just say you have never really experienced or recognized the war that goes on, that that I'd be concerned. I would really be concerned because once once the Holy Spirit resides on the inside of you, you become aware of your sin. You become aware of your need for Christ. You become aware of the battle that's going on. The programs you used to watch, they prick you a certain way. That maybe some of the music you used to listen to, Uh you kind of go, oh man, I used to love that song, but I can't listen to that no more. I'm hearing these lyrics in a new way. (laughs) Right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, Maybe, I, you know, even there's people, friends, uh, places you used to hang out. You, It almost makes you cringe to think, whoa, I used to actually do that. You know, I used to actually go there. I used to actually forsake God for these things. There's a war because the spirit is contrary to the flesh and the flesh is contrary to the spirit. So that you cannot do the things that you would do. Mm-hmm. So it's just a little feel your pulse, you know, just doing a little pulse check right here. This is a good indicator that you are indeed on the Lord's side if you become aware of the struggle. And I talk to a lot of people who, who struggle and they feel like they're failing. But I always tell them the fact that you recognize <laughs> you're, that there's a struggle is a good sign that you're on the right team. Because those who are yeah, those who are in the world, those who serve themselves, they don't give a second thought to it. They, they brag about their raucous living. They brag about their uh, 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 sinful lifestyle. They're proud of it. They wear it like a badge. They tell stories about their conquests when they get to work in the next day. (laughs) They're proud of it. They're not ashamed. Those are the people who I'm concerned about. But if today, if you recognize that there is a battle, and guess what? The battlefield is in your mind and for your soul, then chances are you're, you're on good ground. Because you've been awakened, you've been, your, your eyes have been opened. You are illuminated to the truth. So once again, let's give good, the Lord a hand clap of praise for victories <laughs> that you can see and hear and understand. Because that's not of the natural man. So on page forty-four, the author goes on to say, "We are saved from the penalty and power of sin." We are not yet delivered from the presence of sin until the next life. I always use this as an example to explain uh, why we aren't as, I guess, uh, feeling as victorious as we often feel, you know, as, as based upon what the scripture says and the truth of the word, we are free from the penalty of sin. What is the penalty of sin? Eternal death, Right. If you are saved and your soul will not and cannot die, your sin, your soul 
will go on to live with God. So separation from God is the penalty of sin. But you're his, you're his child. When he looks at you, he Jesus. God and Jesus have an awesome fellowship, love and relationship. So if you're in tune with Christ, then you are his. And so you will avoid the penalty of sin, which is separation at death. The power of sin, we're free from the power of sin. In other words, you have something on the inside, the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, who enables you to say no to sin, whereas before you didn't have that power. But we are not yet delivered from the presence of sin. Presence, sin is always uh, still around us. And once again, that, that is part of that struggle. But one day, we will be very free, even free from the very presence of sin. That's why I, we can't really imagine what heaven's going to be like, because there will be no sin. There will be no guilt. There'll be no more shame. There'll be no more urges. I, I imagine there won't even be any temptation to do wrong because all of the stimulus, all of the things that draw us away, the things that tempt us from the inside out, that's what the scripture says. When you are tempted, don't say you're tempted of God, but we are drawn away of our own lust, the things that are inside of you. That's what causes you to sin. The author goes on to say, the bad dog always manages to recover from his wounds to prod us again in the wrong direction. Isn't that true? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You beat him up one day, but the next day he comes from a different direction. <laughs> he comes another way with this almost the same way, but a different direction catches you off guard and you find yourself falling prey to his tactics, uh, the, the, the stimulus that draws you away. So the bad dog, he's very resilient. He, he won't die, even though we try to kill him every day. Therefore, we must constantly sick, you know, you say you sick your dog on somebody. We must constantly yeah. sick, the, sick the good <laughs> of the bad dog for the rest of our lives to have consistent victory over sin and joyful fellowship with God. The author says, though, he struggled with this. He says, but I couldn't always make the good dog versus the bad dog thing work. I couldn't see that the power of God was involved at all. <clears throat> I had made a choice the same way a moral non-Christian would. And that's, he, he uses the example in the book about cheating on a test. Uh -huh. Now, which one of us in school did not feel at some point tempted to look at somebody else's paper. I didn't. <laughs> Sister Singleton said, nope. I didn't. <laughs> you were the one people, you were the one people wanted to cheat off of, right? Yeah, they did. <laughs> yes, I, I was that person too. I still remember um, in high school we uh, in study hall uh, one guy on the football team with me, he was like, hey, you got Mr. Hogue's math homework? Let me see it. Let me see it. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, sometimes I let him see it. But after a while, I was like, no, nah, man, you got to do your own work. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> was this, remember that commercial? No, my brother, you got to get your own. <laughs> <laughs> remember that, that old commercial? Anyway, I digress. But yeah, he talks about cheating on a test and every little kid and many times was tempted to look at your neighbor's paper. Well, he, he talks about that and say, well, let, he have to call the good dog to, to keep him from looking. That temptation was there. And he said, sometimes I did good and other times I gave in and I looked at my neighbor's paper and I cheated. And so he said that it seemed like it really wasn't a God thing. It was just him making a choice. He says, I either gave in or I resisted. I really wanted to be good, but my early teaching provided more frustration than clear guidance. And see, I think a lot of people, a lot of Christians have had really good intentions. They, they came to church faithfully, 
but they just couldn't get it. They couldn't do it. They they found themselves more frustrated than they uh -huh. really found themselves um, feeling like they were in God's good graces. And for that, once again, I, I think we last week we looked at the, there were two types of people. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm going to have to scroll back to get the exact. Well, it's the, um, uh, the Pharisees and the, and the, um, oh gosh. Yes, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Sadducees. Yes. But here it is. It was the, the shallow copers. Oh, versus yeah. Versus the troubled reflectors. And so as a young man, you know, we've probably all felt, remember the shallow coper was the one who learned to ignore what was inside. In other words, they would go ahead and cheat and say, oh, well, everybody does it. If everybody else does it, it's not going to send me to hell, right? <laughs> That's what a shallow coper does. They manage what they can and what they can't. They don't work. They don't sweat it. They just move on. But then there's the troubled reflector who is they're actually very aware of their sin and they struggle to get over it to the point where they would just want to give up two different approaches to the same problem. But that's where grace comes in. I think grace once again is the answer for both of those groups. If we understand that God has enough grace, God's grace is sufficient. God's grace is patient. God's grace, his love is unconditional. And, and that, that's what helped me. That's what helps me when I struggle is that even when I do fall short, I don't allow the devil to make me think that I've lost my salvation, that I've lost my standing. I tell him to leave me alone. <laughs> You're lying. God still loves me. I'm his child, right? But boy, if he can get in your head and make you think God can't look, look at what you just did. You're pathetic. You're not a Christian. You're not a saint. A Christian wouldn't do that. And that's the thing. He's partly right, but he's mostly wrong. <laughs> right? Because, you know, I was just thinking, I was thinking uh, 1 John 1 and 9. If, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. So it's saying there that as a Christian, we are sinners. We do sin, but it's how you handle that sin. We got to confess our sins. And so to think that a Christian will not sin, doesn't sin, is not realistic. So then the mm -hmm. author says, the author says here, now as an adult, I often get the same feeling, just like he did when he was a little kid trying to make the good dog win in his life. I know there is a path to becoming the person of Christ wants me to be, but I'm frequently unsure of how to piece it all together. Other, other, than, <laughs> other than simply, let me retype this, other than simply choosing to obey. So he's kind of getting to the crux of it here. And, and basically our flesh will never get you to where you need to be in Christ. Two different playing fields. You can't get there in the flesh. You can't do enough good in the flesh. God is not pleased by our works because the scripture says that he has created us for good, week, good works that he will complete in us. So it's about, it is about obedience, but it's about really, in my mind, understanding where you put, where your, your, what your position is in his grace. It's not your works, but it's by grace through faith that we're saved. It's by faith, through, it's, it's, by fa it's by grace through faith that we stay in good standing. So the minute your faith is shaken, that's when you start to feel like you're not in God's good graces. You're not in God's good standing. But don't go there. Don't go there. Man, uh, God does not love like man does. Man will change his mind in a heartbeat. A man will stand at an altar and tell you he's going to love you forever. A woman will stand at the altar and tell you they'll love you forever. 
But then before the first six months, they're already out tipping. Look at mm-hmm. something else. Mm-hmm. But God never mm-hmm. tipped out. God never looks for another lover. He is committed to you. Amen. 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 All right. So uh, then the author talks about doing good versus being good. I, I like this. I like this. I have I have I have a lot of friends who <laughs> I, I feel that they probably go to church. They they believe in the Bible. They believe <laughs> they believe in Jesus Christ. But I really feel they're more focused on doing good than they are actually being good. There is a difference. Doing good has external signs and anybody can do good, right? Even a sinner can do good. If you take a criminal to court, someone who's murdered somebody, they can sit there on trial and look, they can cry. They can say they're sorry, (laughs) ask for forgiveness, right? Even, Even a murderer knows how to be right or do right. But being good is a different thing. And the and, and the only one that's good is Christ. Jesus told oh, the mm-hmm. Pharisees that, right? Mm-hmm. He said, uh, yeah. he told them, why do you call me good? For only God is good. So in order for us to be good, it's got to be in Christ. It, it's all about the motive. Well, let, let's, let's move on. Mm-hmm. The author said, no one except for Jesus presents us with a picture of who we, of who we, who all, (laughs) let me start over here. No one except for Jesus presents us with a picture of who we all know we should be and want to be, right? Jesus is our standard. Jesus is our measuring stick. Not your neighbor, not your pastor. Not the deacon, not the not the deaconess. Uh, they're not your standard. That's not who you measure yourself against. We measure ourselves against Christ and against God's word. And Jesus is God's word in the flesh. So even at our best, we can only be a flawed representation of what a Christian should look like. We'll never attain it. If if there's anyone who feels they are above sin and they have conquered sin, they don't sin anymore, then then you must be part of the Godhead. You're part of the Trinity, apparently. And I <laughs> and I know nobody on this call, nobody in this world <laughs> is part of the Trinity. You're not part of the Holy Trinity. So we all have flaws. <clears throat> we all do things that don't look like Christ. So while we cannot be perfect, we can be better. I've often said, and I've heard it said, that you and I may never become sinless, not on this earth. But we can grow in maturity to sin less. Amen? Amen. (laughs) We may never be sinless, but we should sin less on our journey to becoming more like Christ. Amen. On page 45, the author says, the improvement we really long for goes much deeper than an external likeness to Jesus. <clears throat> we see characteristics in others that we want to emulate. People who are industrious, disciplined, knowledgeable, hospitable. Some people we admire, they're even giving and compassionate and noble. These are all wonderful human characteristics that we all admire. And you don't have to be a Christian to be these things. Then he said that people push him to try harder. Some point to an undefinable, unusual relationship with Christ. Uh, it's like some people talk about this mysterious, you know, relationship with God that they have. And excuse me, getting a little choked up. 
uh, one that goes beyond doctrine and dedication to a personally felt reality. And that's where we all want to mm -hmm. get to. When your faith really becomes real, that's when you know you're in there. <laughs> you start to actually put your faith into action. And that's how your faith grows. Some of us haven't grown as Christians because we've never tested our faith. When we're challenged, we, we run. We, we don't allow God to step in, stand in, in our, on our behalf. We give in to the flesh. We do what the flesh wants us to do because it feels good, looks good, and, and, and gives us a sense of pride. You know, once again, those, the, th the devil's three approaches, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. But when we learn to discipline ourselves, and when you get one victory, you, you say, oh, wow, it does work. <laughs> Anybody ever had that moment where you say, wow, God is real? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But if you never have those moments, then it's it's your mother's religion. It's the pastor's yeah. religion. It's, it's somebody else's relationship. But that's not going to get you through your troubles and your trials. You've got to take ownership of this. You've got to own it. You've got to live it. You've got to breathe it. You've got to apply what you've seen others talk about and what you've read about in his word. That is, if you read the word. That's how you get to that place of personal reality faith. It's beyond doctrine and dedication. It's beyond your efforts to be good, to do good. It gets to the point where good is actually already on the inside. That's a great place to be. That's that Christian maturity, that sanctification. You have new parts. Now think about, you know, restoring, maybe restoring an old vehicle, right? The outside might look the same, but the inside has a new motor, new pistons, new spark plugs, new shocks, new tires. You know, you, you have new parts, and so you run different, <laughs> yeah. right? You, you run better, to, to make yourself a, a car analogy. You've got new parts. you got a new transmission. You don't get stuck in the wrong gear anymore, <laughs> <laughs> Your whole drivetrain has been replaced. Mm -hmm. The author says, I want to do more than exercise kindness to my loved one. He talks specifically about his wife. I want to freely give from deep resources within me. And many of us, because we're shallow, because our Christianity is superficial, we don't have anything deep on the inside. When our flesh gets tired, we give out and we don't walk like Christ anymore. We show our true colors, but a true believer, when they're tested, that's when they shine the most. Amen. <clears throat> he went on to say, I want to do more than teach my kids and enforce rules to keep them in line. Nobody wants to have a relationship with their children. That you always got to feel like always got to feel like always gotta, you're, you're a police officer. <laughs> Who wants to police their kids? Who wants to police their loved ones? Nobody. You want to have a natural loving relationship. He says, instead of policing the rules for my kids, I want to draw them by my life into the pursuit of God. That's a great place to be. All you all you have to do is just live your life. Because you're living the life that God called you to live. You're living the Christian life. So it's like, hey, I don't have to work to do right so you can see me live good, but just follow me. I'm flowing. I'm in the flow. Amen. <laughs> I'm in the flow of the Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus talked about, uh, or I think it was Paul talked about that we're above the law. Because the law is written in our hearts. We don't need to always refer back to the manual because we live the manual. The manual is in our heart, meaning the Holy Spirit. 
Then the author says, I want to do more than preach sermons that are biblically sound. Nothing wrong with that. But he says, I want to pour out my soul in ways that convey truth with personal power. And see, you can only do that if, if you really experience the Lord. It's more than just telling Bible stories. What about the application? What about the truth? And sometimes that's all it takes. And that's all God is actually asking you to do. Tell your story. What difference has God made in your life? What difference has G knowing Jesus made in your life? The author says this type of change requires more than a dedicated effort on our part. In other words, good intentions only last so long. It's less about two dogs fighting, but a discipline of continuous acknowledgement of sin, asking for forgiveness from God, and trusting him to help you grow stronger in that area of struggle. Let's look at Romans 12, 1 through 3. This, I think this is a classic verse when it talks about the change that needs to happen in each one of our lives for us to stop doing good and start being good. Romans 12, 1 through 3. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. And if it weren't for his mercy, all of us would be lost. That ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. See, it must be intentional. You have to offer yourself to the Lord. It doesn't happen by mistake. You don't offer yourself to others. You must offer yourself to Christ. He is the standard. He is your master. He is your Lord. Once you do that, you present yourself holy and acceptable unto him, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. Once again, in the world, but not of the world. We must be transformed by the renewing of your mind. As a man think, so he is, right? So something has to change in your mind. And something must has to change in your heart. It's like Romans 10, 9 and 10. That if thou shalt confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus. So you, the words that come out of your mouth come from your head. You're able to verbalize or express the decision that you made to follow him. But then there's the heart. You have to believe it. So, but it's in your mind. I think a lot of people have, they understand God in their mind, but he hasn't reached their heart. And that's probably where the real struggle is. Once your mind is renewed, Paul goes on to say in verse two, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. And so he, he's touching on pride here. I tell you, pride is one of the biggest things that will get in the way of you really growing as a Christian. And it's very easy, once again, to slip into Christian pride. You become pious. You become a Pharisee. You become one that has a, as Pastor said, a seem right salvation. We must stay sober, sober-minded, lowly in our, in our thinking. Don't think more highly of yourself. Because you made it, you better give God the credit, not, not of your own works, but because God saved you. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not even your faith. It says, according, to God, as court, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. It's not even your faith. God gave you the faith to believe him. You see, that that's why we talk about the permanence of salvation. How can you lose your salvation? Can you undo God's call? I don't think we have enough power to undo something that God did. 
<laughs> you can't reverse yeah. something. No, you can't reverse something. This can you unborn yourself? Think about it. No. You're here. I hear you. I see you on Sunday. You can't make yourself be unborn. You're here. Well, in the same way, in the natural, it's the same in the spiritual. You didn't give birth to yourself. God saved you. You didn't save yourself. It's not of works that any man can boast. When Jesus asked the disciples, who do men say that I am? Some said, well, some think you're Elijah. Some think you're John. He asked Peter directly, Peter, who do you say I am? He, Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And he's like, that right there, that didn't come from man. That was revealed to you. So even our faith, our confession doesn't even belong to us. <laughs> God puts it in you. We just have to realize it and understand, accept it. Amen. Glory to God. I'm trying to take some weight off of somebody's shoulders tonight. It's not even about you. God, it, 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 I don't know how you feel about predestination, but if you're saved, you were meant to be saved and you will be saved until, right? God foreknew. There's nothing that God doesn't know. What could God not know? He knew you'd be saved. He knew I'd be leading Bible study tonight and we'd be studying this book called Inside Out. <laughs> We're just going with the flow. This is not our world. This is God's world, right? Right. <laughs> John already wrote about how the world is going to end in Revelation. It's already done. I know this, this is probably getting a little too existential for some people. <laughs> We still have to live and we still have to make decisions, but you know, God already knows what you're going to do. He's always more than one step ahead of us, right? Yes. I know that's a little mind blowing there. Let's come back down. Let's come on back down. <laughs> so then the author talks about performance or dependence, performance or dependence. Well, I think we know what the right answer is. It's not performance dependence. Dependence is where it lies. God's going to ask you one day, why didn't you depend on me more? Mm. Why didn't you trust me more? If you love me, trust me. Maybe he's saying that to somebody tonight. All right, let's look at Philippians 2, 12 through 13. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So that first verse, verse 12, some people might get hung up on that because it says to do what? Work out your own salvation. Somebody might say, well, wow, that means I got to work to be saved. <laughs> We're working out what God has already worked in. Amen. It doesn't, it doesn't say work for your own salvation. You got to look at the words. Look at the words. It doesn't say work for your own salvation. Work it out. You can't work out something that's not already worked in. Amen. Amen. All right. And then look at verse 13. It kind of re reemphasizes that for it is God. Almost like in the beginning, God. It's God that works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So once again, God is the great initiator. God is the great starter. God is the impetus. God is the one who has given you the new birth. And so it's God who will fulfill that to, for you to do his will and to do his good pleasure. All we have to do is submit, relinquish your rights to your life. Give up your right to live your life your own way. 
And you'll start to see God show up in more powerful and more purposeful ways. I promise you that. I promise you that. If you learn how to submit, test him out, try him out, he'll show up and he'll always show out. But just how do we depend completely on God? That's a good question the author asked right there. Whether our problem is doing something we wish we weren't doing or wanting to completely surrender ourselves to God or struggling to believe we really are loved by God, the bottom line is still the same. He says to try harder. <laughs> um, but is that really the answer? It's easier to define a change based on the effort based on effort than one rooted in dependence on God. He's addressed this earlier that we as humans have an achievement mindset. You know, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Do it your own way. And it's and it's kind of an evolution that we go through. You know, we teach our children at an early age to do what? To be independent, right? I still remember how exciting it was the first time, you know, your baby learns to hold their own bottle. You remember that? Yes. That's a big moment because you don't, that means you can go and kind of do your own thing. You can fix the baby's mm -hmm. bottle and hand it to him. And the baby will sit there and hold it. That means your arms are free now. You can go wash the dishes. <laughs> while your baby, while the baby is drinking his own bottle. That's a big step. That's a big milestone. Okay. And then they learn, and then they learn how to crawl. And you're like, oh boy, oh boy, they're on the move now. <laughs> and then they learn how to walk. They stand up and now they can grab things that they couldn't grab before. And now you got a whole new set of problems. Yeah. <laughs> but you but you need them to make those milestones, but it comes with the cost. And so our dependence on God is where we need to be, not our independence from God. Many of us think being independent is our purpose. Being independent, I don't have to rely on anybody. I'm self-reliant. Well, you know what? That's, that's blasphemy in the eyes of God. Oh, yeah. Not to become the little g god of your own life that's where some people think they have made it they don't have to lean on anybody they don't have to ask anybody for anything but i think many times god keeps us in a position of dependency on him that's why he may not give you all the things you ask for because he knows it would take you it would take your heart it would take your eyes it would take your hands it would take your feet away from him hmm. the author says our lord made it clear that doing right in his eyes requires far more than the performance of certain activities that was that was jesus's whole lecture to the pharisees last week the outward show, remember he said they were like whitewashed sepulchers or graves, clean on the outside, polished, washed white, painted white, pristine, but on the inside were dead man's bones. Wow. Man's bones. Rotting flesh on the inside. Jesus said the entire law could be summarized in two commands. <clears throat> Number one, love God. It starts with your love of God. And then if you say you love God, then you ought to love God's creation. And that includes other human beings. We ought to love God first and love others as ourselves. That's a whole nother lesson right there. Because some people don't love themselves. That's a problem. <laughs> Some people, some people haven't learned to love themselves. Some people haven't learned to forgive themselves. And so therefore, their love for others is tainted. Fulfillment of these commands can only come from profound internal change. Now I'm on the top of page 48. 
in the uh, one book. It says, it can be argued that every personal or behavioral problem, things like a bad temper, perverted sexual desires, depression, anxiety, uh, overeating, overspending, uh, over shopping, you name it, um, verbal abuse, physical abuse, all of these things can be tracked back to violations of the command to love. Wow. He traces everything back to love. But that's what Jesus just said, the greatest commandments, the love of God and the love of others. So if you have a love deficiency in your life, it comes out in very negative ways. It never comes out in a good way. If you've never received love or had your love uh, rejected and, and scarred, it, it, can, it results in something negative. He says that if, tr if true, then learning to love is not only necessary for spiritual maturity, but also central to overcoming psychological problems. Hmm. So where do we begin? It begins beneath the surface. I want to bring up this chart where he talks about where does, you know, where does sin kind of originate? Where do our, our vices come from? I love this chart. It came from a Bible study we did some time ago. Um, it was overcoming life's tests with, uh, I can't remember the exact title, but it, it, we talked about this, the progress of sin, and we're going to end on this note. James 1, 14 through 15 says, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust. That's what I was talking about earlier and enticed. Then when lust have conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So this is the progress of sin. I love this chart. I often refer back to it. So sin begins with an emotion, a feeling or desire or need that goes unmet, right? That kind of lines up with what the author just said. All of our vices, all of our sins stem from some breakdown in love in our life. And so whoever put together this chart would agree with that. Sin begins with an emotion, the feeling or desire of an unmet need. And then there's the enticement to satisfy that need or alter our feelings. And it often comes by illegitimate means. We want to take a shortcut to feel better, right? We want to feel like we belong. We want to feel like we belong. And so the friends we're hanging out with all smoke weed. You don't want to, you don't want to be the outcast. So you do it too. That's just one example. Um, a husband's not getting the love he wants from his wife. A wife's not getting the attention she needs from her husband. And you start to look other places. That enticement to satisfy a legitimate need by illegitimate means. That's how it starts. That's how sin begins. Then it progresses. It's born in your mind. It's conceived in the mind, not in your body. Sin begins in your mind. You think it, you imagine it, you fantasize about it. You begin to make plans to sin. That's what it says here. It's conceived, the idea, and then you entertain the idea. Then you make plans to carry it out, and then you rationalize it and say, yeah, I deserve this. I deserve this. Uh, I shouldn't have to feel this way. Let me fix it. And when you start taking things into your own hands, letting the natural man make plans for you instead of the spiritual man, it never ends well. So from you making plans, right? It was an unmet need conceived in your mind. You entertained it. You thought it out, planned it. Now it becomes a part of your will. See, many of us right here in the mind is where it ought to stop. <laughs> you thought about it, but you know what? The spirit, remember the good dog? This is where the good dog comes yeah. in. He's a dog. <laughs> you know, he's like, warning, warning, don't do that. Don't do it. <laughs> 
that's when the good dog that's when the holy spirit ought to come in and say nope that's a that's a thought but let's not act on it let's remember what you've been taught what would what would the lord what would jesus do wwjd but if it gets beyond that point and it gets to a matter of your will this is where the birth of the outward act of sin starts to take place this is where uh, the sin starts to sprout legs and hands <laughs> and it moves on now to the body you're now sinning in your body it becomes a pattern of ongoing sin and creates a stronghold on your life this is where you know you're getting to the point of no return because now your body's accustomed to it it's part of who you are your attitude has changed and many times you've already well, that's the next piece where you begin to negotiate and say, well, it's okay. And anytime some, when you sin, anytime I sin, you sin, something dies. Your, 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 your ability to become a whole person starts to die. You become bifurcated, separ separated, uh, disjointed from who you really are. Parts of you, you, you don't even know anymore. You don't recognize that person then your conscience can become seared. If the Holy Spirit was in you, you begin to grieve the Holy Spirit. And then the scripture says that at some point, God will even turn you over to a reprobate mind and allow you to go down a path of destruction. Um, in, the, in, in the scriptures, it says that some people are asleep, meaning they died early. Because they lived their life unworthily. They took the things of God not seriously. And some have gone to an early grave. You end up with diseases. You suffer in the body. And eventually, if you don't turn, you can even suffer spiritual death if you have never actually uh, made the Lord, made Jesus Christ Lord of your life. So this is a very serious pro progress of sin, something we all need to take note of in your life. Think about it the next time you're tempted. I want you to think about sin in this way. What emo Let's take a step back when you start to entertain the idea. Okay, I'm clearly missing something that I'm looking for this outside of the will of God. And go back, go back and get that legitimate feeling or emotion met by God's legitimate means, not the illegitimate means that your mind wants to uh, drive you to. All right, we're going to stop right here. Uh, we'll get next thing we're going to talk about next week is dealing with life below the waterline. Let me just show you this image from the book. This is pretty good. I like this. So he talks about the iceberg. Above the waterline is what people can see, your actions, thoughts, and feelings that you share. But beneath the waterline, the stuff that nobody sees are your motives, your urges, memories, and attitudes. So we'll break that down next week. All right. We're already over about three minutes. Let's go ahead and uh, close in prayer. So we'll start next week with dealing with life below the waterline. We're going to look beneath the surface. Father God, as we close out in prayer, we know that there are many prayer needs. We're continuing to pray for those who have lost loved ones. Continue to pray for those, Lord, who have been in the hospital recently but are now back home. Continue to heal, strengthen, and encourage. We thank you, Father, for those who have been traveling, uh, those who may be still away. We pray for safe travels back home. May they find things the way that they left them and in good condition. Father, watch over us. Guard our hearts. Lord, when we get emotional, I pray, Father, that all the red flags that need to fly, that we see them, that we heed the warning signs, that we find that way of escape that you've promised is there. Father, strengthen us. Father, encourage us. Lord, build us up. Put guardrails around our hearts, guardrails around our minds, guardrails around our eyes, guardrails that keep us from going close to the edge. Lord, be an anchor to keep us grounded that we don't drift off. 
when the winds and the waves of life come. Let us stay close to shore, Lord. Let us stay close to your word and true to your word. Lord, every day we're faced with challenges, decisions we need to make. And I pray that you order our steps. Lord, give us grace. Your grace is sufficient to keep us, to bless us, to sustain us through whatever it is we're facing today. Lord, tomorrow's another day and you'll give us grace for tomorrow. Your mercies are new every day. Lord, hold us up. Hold us up in the power of your hand and in the power of your might. Lord, take us by the hand. Walk us through the valleys of the shadows of death. For Lord, they are just shadows. They're not real, but Lord, you are real. You're the only thing that's real in this world. Let us hold you as precious. Let us cherish our relationship with you. Let us nurture our relationship with you. Let us feed our relationship with you with a life of discipline, of prayer, Bible study, evangelism. Father, if we do your will, we know that you would not let us down. You're a God who can't fail. You're omniscient, you know all things. You're omnipotent, you have all power. You're, all, you're omnipresent, you're everywhere at all times. So Lord, keep us. Watch over us tonight. As we end this prayer, we ask you to touch and bless our pastor and first lady in a special way. We look forward to celebrating them on this coming Sunday. We give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good night. God bless you. Love you. Be well, be safe, and be blessed. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. See you Sunday. God's willing. Lord willing. God bless. God bless. Good night.